Sing praise, sing praise, sing praise, sing praise. Forever God is faithful, forever God is strong, forever God is with us, forever and ever.
Father, you are great and awesome God. Blessed be the name, the King of kings, the Lord of lords, the great I am. You are the Alpha and Omega. You are the beginning and the end. God, you are in control of all things. And even though our world has been deceived by the enemy, we proclaim, and we should be proclaiming, at work, at home, in the marketplace, in the parks, wherever we are, that Jesus Christ is Lord. Help us, Lord, not to be intimidated by the voices of evil, but rather to stand boldly for Jesus Christ so that we might be a witness and an example of the joy of salvation for others to follow. We pray in Jesus' marvelous name. Amen. What can wash away my sin? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. What can make me whole again? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Oh, precious is the flow that makes me white as snow. No other fount I know. Nothing but the blood of Jesus. There is nothing but the blood of Christ. There is no work. There is no religion. There is no church. There is no giving. There is nothing but the blood of Christ that can redeem a person from their sins. 
Help us to understand that today about your amazing grace. Help us to understand and help us, Lord, if there's anyone here this morning or people listening on, that, on the television when they watch us, that they've never yielded and surrendered their life to Christ. They've only heard about you. God, I pray your spirit will just, Lord, just captivate their soul and their mind and let them surrender themselves to you. For that is why, Jesus, you came to this earth was to be the payment and the penalty and to pay the penalty for our sin. So Father, I just pray now that you will give us insights to not a freedom just for a nation, but an eternal freedom for a world. I pray in Jesus name. Amen. You may be seated. Every once in a while, you get so excited about preaching, you forget to get ready. Do I look dressed this morning? I forgot my microphone, so I'm using the handheld. But I think I can do that, so that's fine. This is the 4th of July weekend. This is a busy weekend for us here in Hibbing, isn't it? It's, this, it's just the beginning of uh, the reunion. It started yesterday. I, I went yesterday to the dog park, and I was driving slower than normal because I had the window open, and, and, and I just enjoying the outdoors, and it felt like a ghost town. And I thought, where is everybody? This is, this is the kickoff, but it was early in the day, but it's like, wow, it is so quiet and serene in town. I think by the end of the week, that'll change, uh, but, but right now, it's like, this, is, this, this was such a, a relaxing weekend. Everybody, I guess, enjoyed the sun and went out on the, the lakes or something, but it was a great weekend, and to God be the glory. Taking the theme of our nation's Independence Day, um, I wanted to talk about freedom, but not the freedom of our country. I want to talk a little bit about how that came to be, but, but the eternal freedom that all people can have, not just... Uh, this nation. In the 238 years since the colonials signed the Declaration of Independence, the United States of America has been involved in 75 armed conflicts. And you think about that, in 200 years, that means almost, or at least almost half, not all, but half our time has been spent in war. A grand total of 2,717,991 Americans have been killed in those fights for freedom in that 238-year period. I've given you the statistics. You can, you can look at them. You can flash that up there if you want. Um, they're in your notes, I suppose. Um, those are just the top 10 of the 75 in terms of the deaths. The Civil War, obviously, we were fighting each other, and so there was a lot more uh, mortality there. Before I move on, though, I, I want you to pause for a second on that number of 2,717,991,000. That is a lot of people, probably over the population of Minnesota. But it doesn't even scratch the surface of those babies that have been aborted since 1973 of 50-plus million babies. So in a 236-year or 38-year period, we've seen 2,717,991 Americans killed in warfare in whatever it's been since 73, 40-year period, whatever. We have seen 50 million Americans killed without a battle, just at the desire of the parent or parents. Looking at that statistic is to draw our attention to the fact that our nation has celebrated its Independence Day. But what can we conclude from those statistics? Is number one, our nation will always be engaged in deadly conflicts. There will always be evil, there will always be corruption, there will always be violence. And number two, freedom is not free. There's always a price to pay. 
in our price, in our nation, has been 2,717,991. And that's just deaths. That's not talking about those who are wounded and suffering from the wounds. But today I want to remind us all of the hope and joy of eternal freedom that's promised by God. And not just for Americans, but for the whole globe. Now, one of my favorite all-time movies is Independence Day. And uh, I think it's Bill Pullman, I think, it plays the president. And, and if you've never seen it, and I'm not encouraging you have to go out and watch it because it, it's a sci-fi movie. It's about aliens that come to the earth and they take up war and they're going to exterminate the entire globe. And they do a pretty good job about it in the movie. And it looks like the world, humanity, is going to be completely eradicated from the earth. And then a plan begins to germinate, and, uh, and they have one shot at saving the world. And then, of course, it's America that comes to the rescue. And the president gets up, and he talks about the fact that today, and it's on July 4th, that this whole battle is going to take place, coincidentally enough. And he gets up and he says, today is Independence Day, but we're not fighting today for the freedom of our nation or from tyranny. We're fighting for the, uh, for the, the right to exist. And then everybody goes, yeah, you know, all scream and everything. And they get on the, the uh, what do you call that, the Morse code. They start doing that so they can't be intercepted by the aliens. And they coordinate this world attack. And if you've seen the movie, you know it goes pretty good for, for the world. And, and the aliens, not so much, okay? So I hope I'm not a spoiler, but it, it's, it's my favorite movie. I've got, actually, at home, I just noticed I had three copies. And on July 4th, I watched the television without my copies. Just to watch. It's, it's my favorite film. But the reason that I get so excited about that movie is because the, the world, for one purpose, unites for existence, okay? In other words, if this doesn't happen, we are lost. And so that's why he gives that speech. We're fighting for the right to exist. In reality, that's exactly what Jesus did for the world. The world is doomed and it's, it's suffering and, and it's going into a dismal defeat and it's going to be, humanity is going to be lost and Jesus comes on the scene and says, I have come that you might have life and have it abundantly. Today is your Independence Day, so to speak. When Jesus died on the cross, he paid the penalty for every single human being that ever was and ever will be. He said, I have come to redeem you and to save you and give you eternal freedom. Eternal freedom is a free gift. In the book of Romans, chapter 6, verse 23, and I'm sorry, um, in your notes it's wrong. I actually printed it wrong. I want to make sure Darcy got kudos for not doing it wrong. It was my, my fault. Um, but it, in, in Romans 6, 23, it says, the wages of sin is death, meaning separation from God, but the free gift of God is eternal life in Jesus Christ our Lord. Now, some of your translations may not say the word free. Some do. The concept is there, though, that this is a gift. A gift is free. If it's, if it's, not, if it's not free, it's no longer a gift. Okay, so the free gift of God is is eternal life or eternal freedom in Jesus Christ. So if there is this, wage of sin is death. So if there is a gift of eternal freedom, what are we free from? The bondage of sin is the battle. In, John, in Romans 3.23 it says, For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Every single person that was ever born except for Jesus Christ, was born into sin. The reason Christ wasn't born into sin was because he was conceived by the Holy Spirit, who is sinless. And because of that sin that we're born with, that sin nature that we, we acquire at birth, we are separated from God. And you and I both know that even if we were born without sin, if we were created, perhaps, like Adam and Eve, with a sinless nature, and given the opportunity to do everything before God that honors him and never, ever disobey him, you and I, because of our humanity desire for independence, would at some point fail God. 
Those of you that are here today and you have prayed and asked Christ to be your Savior, you have been redeemed from all sin to that point of your salvation. You were sinless at that moment in time when you prayed to receive Christ and ask Him to forgive you, you were cleansed from all unrighteousness. You were pure and holy and spotless because of Christ who is in you. Therefore, you were in the same frame, and I was in the same frame of mind that Adam and Eve were when they were created without sin. I had a choice from that moment on. Do I honor God and live for Him and never disobey Him and never disappoint Him? Or do I surrender to my desires? And you and I both know that we as humans tend to walk back to those desires and try to resurrect the dead that we have put, the death that we have put our lives to. But praise be to God, that doesn't separate us for eternity, but it does cause an interruption in our relationship with Jesus Christ. But we must come to faith in Christ first before we have that relationship. So all have sinned, and what happens as a result of that is we fall short of the glory of God. The relationship that Adam and Eve have was broken when they sinned. The relationship that we want with God is not there until we have sin removed from our life. Satan is the enemy in this battle. Ephesians 6.12 says, Our struggle is not against flesh and blood. I might put in here, being uh, not politically correct, but being modernized in our country, it's not against Republicans and Democrats. It's not against rulers and against the powers, against the world forces of this darkness, against the spiritual forces of wickedness in the heavenly places. It is not against humanity. And our war is not against humanity. It is against Satan, who uses humanity for his efforts. We sometimes lose scope of that, don't we? We sometimes hear an insult coming from someone that doesn't believe like we do. And so we begin, to, we begin to put our energies to stop that person rather than realize it's the enemy that is driving that person or persons. Our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the powers, against the world forces of this darkness, against the spiritual forces of wickedness, in the heavenly places. Satan is at the top of that leadership and he desires for us to fail. If we look at the world, you and I both look at the world probably very similar. It is in a mess. Our own country seems to be drifting further and further away from the values in which we were established. And we go, what's going on? It's because Satan has a foothold he is called the prince of this earth, and he's doing a pretty good job of convincing people that God doesn't exist or he has no place in the public arena. But listen, that sounds dismal, but listen to this. The war is already won. There are skirmishes and there are battles, but the war is already won. John 16, these things I have spoken to you so that in me you have, may have peace. In the world you will have tribulation. But take courage, Jesus says. I've overcome the world. My death wasn't a, finality, a finale. My death, Jesus said, was the beginning of redemption. It was all in God's plan to allow people to be released from their bondage of sin. To defeat Satan, to defeat death, to defeat, to defeat sin. The war is already won. Keep our eyes on that fact. The war is won. When you go through difficulties, when you go through tribulations, when you go through this moment of time in life where the, your peace is upset a little bit, understand that the war is already over. When you have given your life to Christ, the, the enemy is defeated. Christ defeated him on the cross. He's trying desperately to scare us. But he doesn't have power over us unless we surrender ourselves to that power and influence. So eternal freedom is a free gift. Eternal freedom is a product of love. God's love for his children. John 3, 16 and 17, we usually end at 16, but I want to read the whole thing so we understand it in its context. God so loved the world that he gave 
His one and only Son, that whoever believes in Him should not perish, should not be separated, should not be short of the glory of God, so to speak, but have eternal life, everlasting freedom. For God did not send the Son into the world to judge the world, but that the world might be saved through Him. And if the enemy Satan has as one of the greatest um, lies that he has perpetrated is that God is here to judge the world. Now, judgment's coming. But it says in the Scripture that Jesus came to save the world, not to judge it. Unfortunately, when people live out the desire of their flesh and its conflict with the purity of God, and they feel the conviction of the Holy Spirit then the response is, quit judging me. And only Christ and His Spirit can do that. But out of God's love, He came to save the world and anybody who's in the world. You and I have seen and read about some pretty nasty individuals in humanity's history. People that are incredibly vile, and violent, and vicious, ferocious. And they will exist until the day, the day that Jesus comes and establishes His kingdom, His new heaven and His new earth. However, Jesus Christ came in the midst of that violence came to the people who were going to persecute and kill him. And he said, I love you. With a sacrificial love. Romans 5, 8, God demonstrated his own love for us and that while we were yet sinners, still in our sin, still in our vileness and our immorality and our viciousness and our violence, Christ died for us. He didn't wait till we got to a certain point and said, okay, they're, they're beginning to look like they might be able to do a pretty good job, so I'm going to come to them now because they're worthy. He said, they're not worthy, but I love them. And so I'm going to go to this planet, Earth. I'm going to take on the form of flesh, son of man, son of God, and I'm going to live a life of holiness, by the power of the Holy Spirit as a son of man to demonstrate it is possible to do it. And my life will be a sacrifice for the many. It is a powerful, inseparable love. Listen as I read to you from Romans 8, 31 through 39. What then shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who is against us? He did not spare his own son, but delivered him over for us all. How will he not also with him freely give us all things? In other words, the concept, the logic there, is if God loves us so much that he gave his only son on our behalf, why wouldn't he be willing to give freely to us that which we need most in life? Who will bring a charge against God's elect? God is the one who justifies who is the one who condemns? Christ Jesus is he who died, yes, rather who was raised, who is at the right hand of God, who also intercedes for us. Stop again. Jesus Christ intercedes for us before the Father. That's why it's so imperative. We're going to get to this in a minute. But when we talk about the fact there's salvation and no one else but Christ Jesus, it's because Christ is the one who intercedes for us before the Father. Think about that when you pray. That as you're praying, Jesus Christ is interceding in your behalf to the Father before the throne of God. Who will intercede for us? It is Christ. Who will separate us from the love of Christ? Who's going to do that? Will tribulation or distress, persecution or famine, will nakedness or peril or sword, or gun, separate us from the love of Christ? 
Just as it is written, for your sake we are being put to death all day long. We were considered as sheep to be slaughtered. Our persecution is going to continue to happen in the current world system. But in all these things we overwhelmingly conquer through him who loved us. Listen to what Paul says to us as an encouragement. For I am convinced that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, demons, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor heights, nor depth, nor any other created thing will be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen. Right? You can't. You tell me you're not excited about that. That nothing, nothing can separate us from the love of God. And listen, that's just not us here. It's just not believers. God so loved the world. The, 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 the group, the, the Isa or Isi or whatever it is that, that's trying to establish this caliphate over in the Middle East, this world denomination that's the same as like Darius did and the same like some of these other vile nations did, where, where ultimate extreme Islam takes over and beheadings take place again and women are stoned and all these kind of things, things that we think have civilization is now far gone past, it's all coming to play again in the Middle East. We have Russia invading the Ukraine. We have America not knowing what to do with, the, with Iraq. We have wars and rumors of wars and the world is at conflict all the time. 75 years of 220 some years is spent in warfare for a brand new little country called the United States. But I am convinced that no principality, no demons, no angels, nothing created on the earth can separate us from the love of God. And listen, that love goes beyond, and we must understand this because if we're going to be Oh, people that express that love to others. God so loved um, the president of Iran. God so loved the president of the United States. God so loved every single human being that ever was and ever will be. God loved Saddam Hussein. God loved Adolf Hitler. God loved these vile dictators these vile leaders from ancient times. God loves them all. He doesn't love what they're doing, but He wants their soul to be redeemed that they know the joy of salvation. That's why we need to understand that our fight is not against flesh and blood. Because the moment that we turn our fight into flesh and blood, we are attacking those that disagree with us rather than fighting against the real enemy, Satan and his demonic hosts. And then once we come to faith in Christ, Paul, and this is what the main concept of this is, is that, you know what, there is, there is no one, there is nothing that can separate us from love of God. Our eternal freedom is a free gift. Our eternal freedom is a product of love. And our eternal freedom is offered to all. Romans 10, 13, For whoever, whoever will call upon the name of the Lord will be saved. Doesn't matter of nationality. Doesn't matter of social background. Doesn't matter their, what nationality or what, uh, what color of skin they are. How rich they are. How poor they are. How brilliant they are. Or how dumb they are. Doesn't matter. Whoever will call upon the name of the Lord will be saved. So what does it take? What kind of response does that mean to call upon the name of the Lord? First of all, the response must include confession. Romans 10.9 says, If you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. There is a confession that says, I recognize that Christ is the Savior of the world. That response must include faith, Romans 10.10. 10. For with a heart a person believes, 
resulting in righteousness, and with the mouth he confesses, resulting in salvation. So the confession must take place that we acknowledge that Jesus Christ is the Savior of the world. And secondly, that we believe by faith that he can produce righteousness in me. Sinlessness in me. The response must include repentance. This is the hard one. Acts 26, 19 through 20. Paul speaking to King Agrippa. And he says, oh, so King Agrippa, I did not prove disobedience to the heavenly vision, but kept declaring both to those of Damascus first, in other words, he's talking about his missionary journey, also at Jerusalem and then throughout the region of Judea, even to the Gentiles, that they should repent and turn to God. Pause. Repentance means a turnaround. It means we're headed in one direction and then we repent and we turn away from that and we head in an entirely different direction and we don't go back the way we're going, we came. So in humanity, what does this mean? In spirituality, what does this mean? That we're born with sin. Sin separates us from God. We are in bondage to sin. And if we continue in that bondage, we continue to be separated from God. How do we get to the Savior? We must repent of our sins and say, I'm going to follow you, God. Repentance is an act of the will. Redemption and righteousness is the act of the Savior. But he says, if you want salvation, you have to quit walking the direction you're going. You must give up death to sin and turn life to God. And then he says this, and believe, believe this, that your heart, God raised him from the dead, you'll be saved. And then he goes on and says in 10.10, 10, and then we get to King Agrippa. I'm sorry, I lost my place. It says, the response with repentance is this, that you should repent and turn to God, performing deeds appropriate to repentance. That means there's a transformation. And that transformation is a change of character, and of conduct that comes as we surrender, which is the next point. The response includes surrender to Christ Jesus. Romans 6, 18, And having been freed from sin, you became slaves of righteousness. We are in bondage to sin. The concept of this day and age that Paul writes is they understand slavery. Many of them are slaves. He says you are in bondage to sin. But when we surrender to Christ, we repent of our sins, we confess Him and we believe in Him and exercise faith, we are redeemed from our sins through the blood of Jesus Christ. And as a result of that, we move from being in bondage to sin, Satan, and death and now we are slaves to righteousness. We are walking in a way that says, God, I'll follow you and do whatever you call. There's a reason why they, we refer to Jesus Christ as Lord, as King of kings, as Master. It isn't that he's just a little s Savior. Thank you for removing me from all that vileness, and boy, I'm glad I got out of that. But rather, I surrender my life to you. I am indebted to you for my salvation. So what's the point of all this? Is that we receive the offer of eternal freedom found only in Jesus Christ who declares himself as the way, the truth, and the life. And no one comes to the Father. No one experiences or knows eternal freedom but through him. That's John 14, 6. And then we're encouraged in John 8, 32, know the truth. The truth of Jesus Christ. Know the truth, and the truth will set you free. So do you who are here today, do you have eternal freedom? 
Do you have a personal relationship with Christ? Not just a church relationship, not just a religion, not just a concept, but do you have you surrendered, confessed Christ with your mouth, believed in your heart that Jesus was raised from the dead? Have you repented of your sins and surrendered your life to Christ? That's what it takes to become a follower of Jesus Christ, to be redeemed from the bondage of sin and to know and experience eternal salvation and eternal freedom. Do you know the one called truth? Would you like to? Before we go to communion, I'm going to ask that you bow your heads. Communion is a visible demonstration, an acknowledgement, remembering that it was through Christ's broken body and Christ's shed blood that salvation became available to humanity. The Scriptures say in the book of 1 Corinthians 11 that we're supposed to examine ourselves whenever we come to the communion table to make sure that we are coming in an appropriate manner and we're not in the same association of those that called for the death of Christ. Sin separates. Even as a believer, it causes a disruption in our relationship with God. So the first thing he says in, in there is that we are to examine ourselves, and if we don't examine ourselves correctly, the Holy Spirit will examine us, and for this reason, some have even died and gotten sick because they've ignored that warning. Before we serve communion this morning, while your heads are bowed and your eyes are closed, I want to ask and not assume that everyone here already has a relationship with God and has already been redeemed from their sins and is already experiencing eternal freedom. But if there, is there anyone here this morning that says, you know, Pastor, the Holy Spirit's speaking to me right now. The way it's been laid out, the Spirit has truly helped me to understand that I am born into sin and I need, I need to accept salvation for myself. And if you want to do that this morning, would you raise your hand and just say, yes, please remember me in prayer? If you've never prayed to receive Christ and you desire to do that this morning, Please raise your hand just for a moment and put it down. Anyone? All right. I'm going to ask the worship team to come forward as I pray. Heavenly Father, I know that the power of the Holy Spirit speaks volumes into our hearts. There may be people here this morning, Lord, I don't know, but you do. That, that truly you desire come to faith in Christ. And they're resisting. They're pushing back as the Holy Spirit speaks to them, as their heart rapidly beats because they know that, God, this is what you are calling them to. Help them by your Holy Spirit to know that without making that decision and yielding their lives to Christ, they are eternally lost and in bondage to slavery. Thank you that they are taking the time to examine for themselves the free gift. I pray that you will continue, if they are here this morning, to hound them with the Holy Spirit to the point that they, will, they ought one day, if not today, surrender their life to Christ. I pray for those of us that are here that are about to approach the communion table. I pray, Lord that in his next few moments of silence that we will examine ourselves so that we are not guilty of the body and the blood of the Lord and that we can take of the elements freely and celebrate your goodness to us that while we were still sinners you died for us and that we would remember the sacrifice it took for us to be redeemed and be given eternal salvation, eternal freedom. Thank you, Father, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Communion this morning, we're going to do, uh, ask you to come forward and receive the elements for yourself. Take both the bread and the cup back to the seat. And when you feel that you are ready to receive the elements, whether it be alone or with your family, then just take those as we sing. I'm going to ask elders that we have here this morning to come and sit in the front, and any deaconess would like to do that as well. If you want a, if you want a prayer... This morning, if you want to ask God to give you a healing, physically or otherwise, 
we believe that Jesus Christ is our healer. And so we want you to just remain up here. We have oil here that the, anoint, the elders can anoint you with oil, as the Scripture tells us in the book of James, and pray the prayer of faith that you might receive a healing. Now, the healing comes from God. We don't heal. We can't heal. Jesus can. But we must ask him. James 5 says, if you're sick, call for the elders of the church, confess your sins to one another, pray the prayer of faith so that you will be healed. And so we, we're going to pray that the healing that God has for you will come. We don't know how that's going to happen. We just know that God has the power to heal. And so as we begin to sing, come and get the elements. If you would like prayer, just, just sit here and have your communion or go back to your family, have communion with your family if you want to do that, and then come forward because we're singing two songs to close this morning. But come. If, if you have heard from the Holy Spirit and you need to talk to someone about what you're feeling, or sensing. The elders and the deaconesses are here to help you with that as well. So just stay up front. If you just want prayer, stay up front. But this is a time that you can receive a blessing from the Lord as people minister to you. So as we sing this first song, we're going to invite you to come forward, grab the bread and the cup, and take it back to your, your seats. And then we'll give you more instruction at, at, at the close of the first song. For a moment, though, would you just take a few moments of silence before God so that you can examine yourselves before Him before we receive the elements? Father God, thank you for these elements, the bread that represents the body of Christ, the body that was bruised for our iniquities, whose stripes, through whose stripes, we can expect and pray for healing. Thank you for the blood that's represented by the cup, the blood of Christ that covers a multitude of sins, that pays for the penalty of every human being. And if we will just confess with our mouth, exercise faith, surrender ourselves to you in repentance, that you will redeem us. Thank you for our salvation. Now, Lord, let this be a time of great communion with you as individuals receive the bread and the cup. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, God the Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Amen. Let's sing. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved the wretch like me.
Lord Jesus Christ, we do believe that you are our Savior. You are our sanctifier. You are our healer. And you are our coming King. Lord God, we surrender our lives to you. And I pray, Lord, there's anyone here that is hesitating to be prayed for. But in this last song, they'll come forward to receive the rich blessing that you have prepared just for them. As our Savior, Sanctifier, Healer, and Coming King, you have great gifts for us, free gifts, but we must reach out and accept that and receive that for ourselves. So God, I just pray now, if anyone's hesitating, let them come forward and receive your gift. In Jesus' name, amen. Would you please stand as we sing this final song? Father, God has been so good to worship with you, with these friends, both those who are regulars here, Lord, and those guests that have come. Thank you so much, Lord God, that we can worship you together. Thank you for the message of salvation that you've given and reminded us of. Thank you for the table that draws us back to that understanding, at least as much as we can, of your sacrifice on our behalf. God Almighty, I just pray now that you will go with us this week. And Father, that this week of celebration in our town, that we will be a light in our community of Jesus Christ. That you will give protection and safety over this community. There's going to be thousands of people that normally are not here. Lord, I just pray that you will guide us to be light and that, God, you will protect us from evil and from injury and from and from danger. Let this community experienced the blessing of God in a way that we haven't for a long, long time or ever before. I just pray, God, you would be blessed this week as we lift up the name of Jesus. I pray this in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. As you leave this morning, please go quietly so those that are praying are not interrupted. And uh, board members, at about 1045, we'll meet over in the youth room. Go in God's peace.